It's like the main thing about the Christian life. Like, if you don't get that, there's really no point getting anything else. Huh. I want to explain to you, I want to, I want to keep going with that. I don't want to be everything I said last week. Again, last week to me was critical, critical for the Christian life. And I understand that you can go through the Christian life, as we saw last week, <laughs> that without understanding it. That's why Paul said, as all the saints should know or understand. You can go through the Christian life not really fully uh, understanding how it is you appropriate God's love. Not really understanding how that peace can come, in, even in, this, in spite of all the light can throw you. And I said, I said, bring it last week. And uh, I feel like the one who's listening to me was the Lord, and he brought it. And my wife said, please don't say it again. But it really gave me a sense of God's presence.
I saying in that moment? And again, I'm just using this as an illustration to get us to get traction with this. What am I saying? I'm saying, whether I'm oblivious to this or not, like, I'll, I'll, let me back up. We, we don't, here's the way that I'll, I'll argue. We don't have to, when we're born, when we come into existence, we don't have to be taught what our soul's needs are. You know, there are certain things as your mind develops, say you're a baby and you're growing towards 18 months and then two years and, and three years old and through all those formative years, you, there are certain things as your brain develops that you take on. Like, for instance, the ability to take on memory. At first, your, your brain doesn't have that capacity. But the soul is different. Like, the way I look at it is the soul comes into existence fully operational. Like, it, it has the needs from day one. The needs that it has, it has from day one. It was created with those things. It doesn't have to wait for development. So, for instance, if, if I say, if we say, if we understand everyone is born looking for someone looking for them, that soul need is present from birth. Actually, before I could argue, but in, in, what is the first encounter that soul is supposed to have? The mom. Like that soul need, is, it comes into the world with that soul need, and that soul need is rushed to be met by the, by the loving arms and embrace of the mother. And that begins to set a strong foundation of security and stability and brain development and all these other things for that child. But if I take that and I, and I look at the situation I'm talking about, it's like having a sense of, I need a sense of meaning and fulfillment and satisfaction. But see, what, here's, well, here's the mistake. If I look out of a room and I'm, I'm tempted, I'm tempted to, to, to respond with an analysis that says meaninglessness, Timothy. Now, my fallenness, and if you look back at my, my life story, my, my temptation, my weakness is to run. Uh, some of you know my story. I ran for seven and seven years. When I got hurt, I would run. That's why my family didn't see me for four and a half years. Intentionally, I was running. I was good at that. And my wife saw that in our, in, in my, in our marriage, like with things, and she would see, now she's been seeing growth in my life. Now, the, last week, I really praise the Lord for the, for the message he gave because I, I did anything but run. And what, how blessed I was. Now, how, how do I not run? How do I not come back with an analysis that goes to meaninglessness, which is to say hopelessness, which is to say dark place headed in that direction. In that moment, I'm, I'm saying... My soul has a need that's not being met, and that's the mistake. I'm looking to the circumstance or to other people to meet a need in my soul. And the result is I, I reflect, not the image of God in that moment, I reflect my circumstances. Now, what is... And if I continued in on that, I would be self-deceived because it's actually not reality. Now, it could be reality that, you know, let's just say objectively speaking, that one investment of my life is not as good as a, of an investment as another investment. But let's set that part aside. I'm talking about my soul, my sense of meaningless and the heaviness and, and the feelings and emotions that go along with that. Actually, man looketh on the outward appearance and God looks at the heart. So I'm looking on the external. But if God sees my heart and sees my motive, seeing that I'm, what I'm doing is for him and for his glory, Timothy, would you do it for one? See, I have to be doing it for one. Because who is the one? And, and if I can remember that and appropriate, like, Timothy, it's not meaningless. You're doing it for me. 
And don't forget, this is infinitely meaningful because you're doing it for me. Timothy, I know you're following my will. Your desire is to please me. To be obedient, to submit to me, all these things. And Timothy, don't forget how much I love you. And when you stand before me face to face on that day, you're going to even more fully understand and experience how much I love you and how meaningful your investment, your sacrifices were for me. To hear, well done, good, good, faithful servant. I'm well pleased. I'm proud of you, and I love you. If I can learn to appropriate that, better yet, if I can learn to experience that love by the power of the Holy Spirit in those moments, what happens? I don't need anything from my circumstances, my environment, to feel satisfied and fulfilled. What is actually true is God is meeting my needs in the moment. And the only reason why I would feel differently is because I've been distracted and forgotten. Do you see? So I'm not desperate for this room to be filled. I want it to be filled, but I'm not desperate for it. I don't have to have it in order to be okay. Now you think about what you have to have in order to be okay. So when we're tempted, and here's the way we like to say it. And we're saying this because we want you to get learn the spiritual discipline of paying attention to what your soul is paying attention to. Because when you think about when you're, what you have to have in order to be okay, what is it? And you say, in the way, what highlights those moments, those soul moments where your soul is kind of communicating to you is where you lose it. When you're moving towards depression or darkness or anger or fear, what's happening? Your soul's saying, I'm not, I'm not filled up. I feel a sense of loss. I feel ashamed. So I, you know, we, we talked, there's a lot of ways. The idea of shame, one way to look at it, one facet is to say, I feel shame when my soul's not filled, when it's not satisfied, when its needs are not being met. Or I feel shame when those needs are threatened. Like, the way that my soul is being satisfied could be taken away. And I feel fear as a result. Now, having said all that, I just want to get into the mechanics. I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet and clear. Because I, we got to walk away with this truth. So let me, let me begin by, by rereading Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Because I want you to say, see this is deeply biblical. You know what, what? The thing about the scripture is the scripture is giving you all the time what your soul needs. But it doesn't explain the, sometimes the why. It just does it. And so we can gloss over these passages not knowing the, understanding the full depth of what the Bible is actually giving you. And it's just it, it, the temptation is to let it be, just be spiritual language. But the soul is, understands you better than you understand you. Better than I understand me. And so it's giving you something important. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father to pray, God, get me out of the suffering. God, get me out of prison. No, that's not what Paul's praying here. I bow my knees before the Father. There's that relationship. From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. We talked about that last week. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Like just throw the scarcity mindset out the window. The riches of his glory. To be what? Strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Strengthened with power. When are you dark? moving towards depression or whatever thing where you need to be strengthened with power in your inner man by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the way I'm defining that just to try to really get traction with us is to say your soul has needs 
It's designed to have needs. God's design. And those needs are all, it's the, the whole point of the design is for you to learn to have those needs satisfied in God. That's it. And that can happen. And Paul's praying it would happen. Which means you, it is, there's a possibility of doing the Christian life without understanding that. Without having access and knowing you have access to the power that will strengthen you in spite of any circumstance. Like you can be stable and secure. Now, when is that stability, that supernatural stability and security going to be most evident as a light to the world? When darkness comes that would have shipwrecked anybody else. But yet you're rock solid. But you will not be rock solid if you're looking to your environment or other people to satisfy that which they were not meant to ultimately satisfy. And I can't, I will fail you, we will fail each other, people will fail you, life will fail you, but guess who will never fail you? And it can't just be, I know that that's true, God loves me. It has to be experiential. I'm going to talk about that. He goes on, and again, we said verse 17 is a restating of the petition or request that Paul is making in, the, in verse 16. He's restating it in a different way. So he says in verse 16, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And notice how the NLT and other translations say, so that, as if this was the result. No, it's the same thing stated a different way. Like if you have a Bible software program and you highlight, you have a cursor and you highlight uh, the word so that, whereas every other word in the sentence will have a pop-up telling you what the original word is, there won't be a pop-up on that because it doesn't exist. The, NL, the English translators is trying to make the flow. But the grammar says it's the same thing as, the, as spirit strengthening with power of verse 16. It's just restated in a different way, which is you find all the time in Old Testament. We call that Hebrew poetry in the sense of parallelism. So that Christ, so I could translate it, that is to say that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christ is going to dwell there. He's going to fill hearts. I'm going to redefine that as soul in the way I'm defining soul. Inner man, heart, soul. Christ can live there, dwell there, fill that up. Now, it's nice when other people help fill up your soul. That's great. We want to love one another. God has called us to love one another, for instance, or that other person. And we want to do that because that's an expression of who God is. We want to help fill each other's souls up. I'm not saying at all it's wrong when, when uh, other relationships you have fill up your soul. But there will time, be times when we fail each other. So what happens then? You need a rock in your life. You need something rock solid, guaranteed, that cannot be threatened, that cannot be taken away. Because there will be times when you feel threatened, like something is being withheld from you, that your soul needs, and you don't understand because you're confused and you're overwhelmed, and you don't understand the dynamic of even what's going inside of you. But the idea of the spiritual discipline, as I, was, I don't know if I finished, to say, I'm paying attention to what I'm paying attention to in those moments when I feel threatened. I'm paying attention to what I'm paying attention to. What am I saying? I'm saying I'm paying attention to what my soul's taught, telling me. So in, in just having that discipline of saying, and, and always, instead of always focusing outward, in those moments of we feel threatened, now we're turn, turning inward and saying, what is my soul doing? What's it asking for? How does it feel threatened? Where's the darkness? Because if, we, if we're just focused externally, we're going to lash out because we're going to grasp. We're desperate. We're trying to regain a sense of security and stability. And because you're a finite creature, you're not always successful at that. You're coming face to face with your own finitude and you feel powerless and you lash out, and you, you, you be this controlling person or whatever because you're trying to get that which your soul needs, but you're trying to fill that need in a way it, they, it, can't, it can't function, it can't work. What are you going to do, hold people at gunpoint and say, love me, be, be tender to me? You see it? 
so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted, grounded, see the security and stability he's talking about? Rooted, grounded, secure, stable, not threatened by the circumstances of life, When that, when that one I love most is, is withholding affection from me, I want to lash out and cause them to love me again. No, no, no. I don't have to lash out. I don't have to force. Because why? I'm rooted. I'm grounded. My soul's satisfied. And when they withhold from me, that's okay. Guess what? I'm filled up and I have something to give. I don't, always, I don't have to be a taker. I can be a giver. I'm not looking to other people to, to satisfy my soul ultimately, which frees me up from any desperation and darkness. I'm here to give. I want to, here's my job. I want to love, I want to be the most loving person in the room. That's all my, I need my job to be. I, I want to love people the best. Like imagine being in a, in a place where that's all everybody's trying to do. The church... Rooted and grounded in love, may, that being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend, understand with all the saints <clears throat> what is the breadth and length and height and depth. We talked about that last week. And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. And to know the love of Christ, know, know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. I want to say, I'm not saying this is all that that means, but at least it's definitely part of it. It's saying it's not just head knowledge, it's not just intellectual, it's experiential. Like the Christian, Christianity and our faith cannot be just reduced to a list of bullet points. You know the bullet points, you're going to heaven. You don't know the bullet points, you're going to hell. Is that it? Like you get to heaven and God says you didn't know enough bullet points. Which is to say you weren't spiritual enough. Is that all it is? It surpasses knowledge, experiential. And I have other Bible verses for that. That you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, I think that works two ways, being filled up. Your soul's being satisfied, and you're also, in those moments, able to reflect out the image and likeness of God to the rest of creation, which is your reason for being created, part of your main purpose. So I want you to just stop right now and, and think about when you feel threatened through your life, your personality— like if our, all of our souls have the same needs, there, there might be uh, differences in, you know, I, we rank this one a little bit more and this one a little bit more. But here's the way I look at it. And you might have heard me say this before in personal conversation. Like there is a commonality, a singularity in all of humanity because we all have the same soul needs. There's the simplicity. I'm telling you, you can use this to the glory of God. Any situation you encounter can be reduced to a search for the soul's satisfaction. Whether in your life or in the life of others. That's what everybody is doing. That's why we said last week, the story of your life is the search for your soul to be satisfied and fulfilled. And when people are acting crazy, you can't understand them. Like, why are you going off in the deep end? Why are you going that direction? Why are you lashing out on me? It's only ever the same thing. Whatever situation it might be, that's what I'm going to argue. Where the complexity comes is in the personality and the life circumstance. Like, that seems so complex, and we see, okay, all these people are so different. No, no, if you can see past that in your analysis to see it's the, it's the desire for the soul to be satisfied, you'll be able to help yourself by appropriating God's love, learning that spiritual discipline, but you'll be able to help so many others because you'll see past the complexity to the simplicity of the soul's search for meaning, satisfaction, and fulfillment. That's all it ever is, I'm going to argue.
So in order to bring clarity, I just made a list of uh, soul needs. And you tell me these aren't true for you. Tell me you're the exception. Sociopaths are an interesting case. We could go on into psychopaths and say that's an interesting case. But let's, let's keep it simple. Soul needs. I already mentioned one. Hope. I actually mentioned two. I mentioned hope. Your soul needs hope. It needs meaning. What are some others? Beauty. Beauty. Your soul needs beauty. Huh. Artists understand this. We're all born artists, by the way. Love. Love. You need, your soul needs to be loved. Because you're made in the image and likeness of God, who is love. God is, has all, always, only ever been receiving and giving love in the community of God. Your soul needs love. What, how do we define that? We define it this way. Again, I'm going to keep saying it because it gets so much traction. We, we need to be loved in the sense that we feel, in the sense that we are seen, not invisible. Seen, not isolated. Seen, not alone. Isn't it funny how it shows up in the cultural vernacular? I see you. Do you see how that works? Culture's on to something. I see you. To be seen, to be known, known, not alien. And understood. To be connected with others and something greater than yourself. The soul needs to be connected with something greater than itself. For instance, that's one of the reasons why my marriage is so deeply satisfying to my soul. Why? Because I, not only in my marriage, I am seen, I am known, I am understood. But I realized the two of us becoming, having become one flesh is greater, the we is greater than the me. It's greater. It's more precious. And, and in my marriage, my soul is satisfied, experiences satisfaction because my soul needs to be connected and it needs to be attached to something greater than myself. And my marriage fulfills those needs. But what happens when my marriage is threatened? I am attached. That is not the only thing I'm attached to. I'm attached to God. I'm his child. That is infinitely greater than myself. I'm, I'm all right. I don't have to be desperate if my wife withholds affection from me or if I disappoint her and she's letting me know that and I, my, my, my sense of needing respect as a man is very much depleted. Dare I say I'm emasculated. And like, no, 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 no. I don't have to become, you know, that doesn't have to become a self-fulfilling prophecy because I realize, you know what? I'm being filled up by God, and I don't have, I've been disrespectful. I can take responsibility for that. I don't have to lash out at her and give her even more reasons to disrespect me so that it would be just like a downward spiral. Love. Empathy. Empathy is just another way of saying what I just said, saying no understood. Some of these are overlap. Some, some of these are synonyms. Empathy, meaning, as I said, to say... That the physical world is all there is, can be, and has been very destructive to the soul. Atheism can be very destructive to the soul. If you think the material universe is all there is, immediately, if you understand what the implications of that, you're taking away meaning. What do people who take that worldview begin to automatically to begin to do? To reconstruct meaning. I really think that's a lot of what Nietzsche was trying to do. Give us an, a, a foundation for justifiably doing so. We have to reconstruct. If we, if we take away God, we take away meaning. But then we have to reconstruct it. Now, that to me doesn't satisfy my soul. Maybe you're, you're good with that. Because it, I'm not God. Can I just make a side point? Now that I'm thinking of it. 
You know how the world, and I read this, and maybe you've said this, and I'm not here to shame anyone. We, people say this, and I've just been meditating on this, and here's what I'm coming up with. And you can disagree with me. I'm not trying to... They'll say things, and I'll, read, I'll be reading a book, and it'll give me a long list of things your soul needs. That's the way I put it. They may not be saying that's what they're doing, but that's what they're doing. And they'll say, but you can't do any of that until you learn to love yourself. You have to learn to love yourself. I, I hear on YouTube videos and in books. And you know what I think is happening there? Again, feel free to push back. You know what I think is happening? It's, when someone says that, it's the acknowledgement that your soul has needs. Here's the way I look at it. Your soul has needs. They need to be filled up. And you have to do that for yourself. Because if you don't have a biblical, theological, if you don't have God, there, that, it creates a vacuum. There's a blank space in the sentence. And it has to be filled up. And if you don't have God, and, and because we're made in the image and likeness of God, we're designed to have that filled up with God. So if, if I, I just take my eraser on my big pencil, and I erase that out until you can't love others until you love yourself, I'll just erase that part of it, love yourself, and I'll fill it in with until I learn how much God loves me. See, now I'm connected with something greater than myself. I'm connected to an infinite source of love. I think that's what's happening. Can you imagine not having that category? Hmm. Joy. You can experience joy even when you're not happy. My wife thinks I do this all the time. Joy. Next, to feel worth. Your soul needs to feel worth or to feel worthy. Worthy. To know and feel that I am valuable, that I am honored. That's all one sentence. I'm trying to say the same thing. To feel worth, worth to know that I am, and believe that I am worthy. To know and feel that I am valuable and honored. Why is it that a son and a daughter... And I always say a son especially because I'm just, you know, that was my experience growing up. A son needs to hear from his father, I'm proud of you, son. Do you see how when a father will say that, the way that God the Father said it to God the Son, it's satisfying the soul need. That's why it's meaningful and important and, and critical and vital. I'm proud of you, son. Why? The son is feeling honor. And through that honor comes a sense of dignity. And do you see how that's I identity forming? To be able to be vulnerable. Now, I could say if there's primary and secondary soul needs, I want to put vulnerability as a secondary need in my organization structure, in my head. To be able to be vulnerable, and I want you to catch this, please. To be able to take my armor off. Why? Why does my soul need that? I need to be able to take my armor off and be vulnerable while still being safe and secure. Why? Because this is, it's, it's, it's of necessity. If you don't have that, you will not experience love. You've cut yourself off from love. You put your armor up against love. You think, no, I'm defending my soul. Yeah, you see that, but you're also cutting yourself off from love because you're designed to be connected, but you're retreating back into isolation. You're trying to protect yourself, but without vulnerability. If you can't take your armor off, off how can you be seen? All people see is the armor. Rebecca, I wish you could throw that meme up you showed me this morning. It was Halloween costumes of 2021. Squid Games. Uh, scream I think it was Scream 
He's got a long mask. Thanks, Michael. Um, I forget the third one, but the fourth one was, what was this, Rebecca? The Christian I'm doing fine what? The Christian I'm doing fine mask. Masks, Halloween costumes of 2021. I'm fine. I got my armor on. Now, check this out. Please, check this out. You know, I, I thought the kids were going to be downstairs. Can we distract the kids for a second? I'm going to try to be cryptic, but you guys know what I'm, I'm saying, okay? You guys ready for this? Sexual intimacy. Do you guys hear me? Do you guys hear that? Not all of you. Not all of you. Uh, 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 intimacy that husband and wife have. Is that, you guys get that? You know what, you know what that means? You guys, you guys know what that means, right? What is happening in that act, that physical act? Vulnerability. Armor's being taken off. It's like, that is an expression. Like, the one way of understanding that act, like, God, why did you design that? Interesting thing that you design humans to do. We are taking our armor off and being vulnerable and receiving and being seen, known, understood. Now, guess what? You can do that act in a way where you still have your armor on. What happens? What's the difference? In, in, in the first scenario where you're actually vulnerable, you feel seen, known, understood. It's deeply satisfying to your soul. The other scenario, you have your armor off, you're going through the motions, and it's contaminating to your soul. Let's go off, let's go to the very end of the spectrum. Rape. Contaminating to the soul. It wasn't vulnerability. It was armor on. It was against the will. It wasn't, you know what I mean? It was being taken from. It wasn't a mutual self-giving. So the same act is completely different. It's apples and oranges. It's worlds apart, universes apart. One is soul fulfilling, one is soul contaminating. And people get hung up on that because if they only experience the contamination, the temptation is to think that all, all of that kind of act is all contaminating. But no, it's designed by God to be an expression of how your soul works. It's designed by God to, f to help, uh, to be a means of, uh, or a vessel, or to fill your soul. That's why it's important. Husbands understand this, where we make sure we're creating an environment and a context where it's soul fulfilling, not soul contaminating. There's more that could be said there. We've got to move on. Intimacy. Intimacy. Acceptance and affirmation of my true person. Again, so much overlap here. Acceptance and affirmation of my true person. Authenticity. The need to express my true thoughts, feelings, and emotions in a safe environment. It's growing up in an environment where you're not allowed to be authentic because, oh, authentic children don't get loved. Children are being authentic to themselves, and the, the parent sh with a shallow analysis, you know, is irked, feels uh, inconvenienced, responds with, shut up, Does, you're, stop being so bad. Why did you do such a bad thing? whatever, but the kid is just being authentic and needs to be walked through that situation or whatever. The, the child needs to be able to feel what they're feeling instead of being told your feelings make you bad, and so you don't express those, and so we hold those things in. Or, you know, for instance, an extreme case, abuse, where a, a child can't fight back. There's so much at, th at risk there because being cut off from the community if it's exposed or not being loved and the confusion of someone they're is supposed to love them and they need the love from is actually also hurting them and they don't understand that and contaminating to the soul 
and authenticity is lost and that can be carried with you into, into the future. The soul also needs, kind of switching gears here, the soul also needs soul cleansing. Often said here, soul cleansing. Your soul has to be cleansed. Why? Because of what we just said. You're, because we're living in a fallen dark world, you're going to pick up contamination. Your soul's going to pick up contamination. And that will poison you and your life and your relationships and your, and your values and your choices. The soul needs to be cleansed. It needs, and here's the way I like to say it, and we've said this a lot late recently, it needs to be, it needs, the soul needs confession. You know how we always say confession is good for the soul. Why is that? Confession is, confession, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Do you see how those are soul needs? What is the Bible giving you? Why, what is the, the Bible empowering you to seek and pursue? Confession, forgiveness, reconciliation. Do you see how the, soul, the Bible so often is speaking to your soul's needs? In fact, that's what it's, what it's always doing. You need that, like your body needs air and sleep and food. Recreation. The soul also needs to experience beauty. The soul also needs not only to experience beauty, but to help create it. And uh, Diane informed me that Kurt Thompson has a new book out, and that's the whole premise. Our souls need to create beauty. And if a young person comes to you which says, what should I do with my life? What career should I have? Tell, t speak to their soul. Say, find something you're passionate about where you can create and bring beauty into the world. And you'll feel, find deep meaning in that. To help, your soul needs to be able to create something beautiful. I, and I, illustration. Well, how do parents feel when in the delivery room of the hospital tired, worn out, exhausted, but what do they also feel? Look what we did. We, we brought beauty into the world. And they're just standing there amazed in the complexity, in the intricacy, and in all that's happening as those bonds are being strengthened in that space and in that moment. And the soul is being satisfied through the expression of God's design. So, I just, there's other things that we could put on this list. These soul needs are why, check us out, I want to go a little bit further with that, and we're going to get back on our track. These soul needs are why we must face and feel our shame while simultaneously experiencing love in order to be healed. Which is to say, in order for our soul to be cleansed and feel connected and restored. That's probably not clear enough. So, if our soul needs to be seen, known, understood, and it can only do that by being vulnerable, taking the armor off, then if our, if, if our response to the shame is to run into isolation, we're only running away from love. In order to correct what seems intuitive, to run... In order to correct that, what needs to happen instead is people have to become courageous enough to, to, in spite of what they've experienced in the past, to be able to take their armor off, become vulnerable so they can, in that moment, experience love, to be seen, known, and understood, so that a new association is formed, whereas before, shame always led to fear. Now, a new association is formed because when I shared my shame, I experienced empathy, I experienced love. And you see how that begins to dismantle the bond the shame has to fear and all those other negative things, the darkness and depression and, and lack of, all the opposites of what the soul needs. And so in spite of the shame, the person uh, is vulnerable and experiences love and that sets them on the right track to understanding once again that it, this is the path to love. This is the way we've been designed and created. There's much more that could be said there. We've said it in the past. As long as we're running from and hiding from and locking up our shame in the closet, in the basement, in a safe that no one has the combination to, we cut ourselves off from 
any of the soul needs being met. Now, I hope that's clear enough. Do you see how that works? If, if we lock up our shame, we're cutting ourselves off from our soul's needs being met. Do you see how, if that's the case, how someone could get stuck in a loop and why time would not heal all wounds? It seems very normal and natural to it of us to lock it all up, keep it away, don't let anybody see those skeletons, and then you get stuck there indefinitely because that seems like the right thing to do. But you've only guaranteed your soul's cut off from that which it really needs in, 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 in a deep way. Now, God can overcome all that, and that's what God does. So I want to again repeat myself and say the soul needs that we've just mentioned, for instance, are why we can say that the story of your life is the search to satisfy and fulfill your soul. Some people are trying to do that through a career. And they experience some soul satisfaction, and the result is they can become a workaholic. You know, you, you just take this framework and work it out, flesh it out through any scenario. And you can see how every human needs God. Because, and we'll see, well, I'll get ahead of myself. Okay. So how does all this work? I want to get into mechanics. I hope this is, gets traction with you. I know it gets traction with me, but I'm strange. So how does this work? The Lord, here's the way I'm going to say it. The Lord is already supplying everything our soul needs. He's already supplying it. So I am called upon, again, through faith. That's what Paul's saying. We need to learn to appropriate these truths through faith, through believing and trusting which means for some of us, our tightened fist has to be loosened and maybe even opened. And that's, that's through faith. Like, God, what you're saying seems very unsafe. I'm, it feels like I'm going to be uh, unstable and insecure and, like, experience more pain because vulnerability leads to pain. That's what I know in life. But I'm going to trust you through faith to step out. That's spiritual discipline. So I appropriate this truth, the idea that God is already supplying everything my soul needs. I appropriate this as I see when what my soul is longing for, I'm paying attention to what my soul is paying attention to, to what my soul is longing for in that moment and realize that the perceived threat of something being taken away from me in that moment is actually false. False. It's my perception, but it's not reality. It doesn't have to be reality. We can make it reality. Because our actions stem from our beliefs. So we got to change it at the belief level and realize that's where, like, man, so many psalms make sense in that context. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. What is being said there? Do you guys even know what bless means? You notice it says, bless the Lord, oh my what? Soul. What is being said there? Just simply in, like, God can bless us, right? We get that. But then the psalm repeatedly, I think there's like at least four or five psalms to say this. That psalm is saying that we are to bless the Lord. Our, my soul is to bless the Lord. What is that, what is actually being said there? Cut to the chase. The psalmist, it's a recognition that God is the source of my soul's satisfaction. So I think of, I, what I think of is, you know, Isaac blessing, putting his blessing on what was supposed to be Esau. What did I say, Jacob? No, Isaac's supposed to bless uh, Esau and he blessed Jacob and said, what is he saying? Okay, I'm, I'm, reali I, I'm giving you my special power. That's actually what's in the, in the Hebrew lexicon. I'm the source, not the ultimate source, but I'm going to pass that on to you. And so what the psalmist is saying, like, my soul, I'm realizing that that source of special power, which is the special manifestation of God's presence, is sourced in him. And soul, remember that. In this moment, remember that God is the source of our soul's satisfaction. That's what the psalmist is calling you to remember and appropriate. No, let me ask you a question. What's the difference between everything I'm saying and believing in 
And again, I just want to flesh this out. And believing in an imaginary friend. Am I simply telling you, believe in this imaginary friend, in this imaginary love that your imaginary friend has for you, and your life will be better? Is that what I'm saying? How is it not that? How is what I'm saying not that? Any answers? Rhetorical or internal dialogue? Answer internally. And what would be the difference between imaginary friend and imaginary love and what I'm saying? I'm going to give you a few Jeopardy seconds. What? Okay, we need to stop. We got to put the microphone down, and we have to give a round of applause for Adelia. Yeah, that's right. Moving on. Good answer. Adelia said, because God is real. Let me just elaborate on that just a little bit. Because... Because, here's the difference, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit is absolutely, he is absolutely involved and he does care and your prayer does change things and you really, really aren't alone. Like I saw that last week, like God was catching the live stream. And he says, oh yeah? You're serious about that? And I said, bring it, and God brought it. And I just got the sense of, wow. Wow. God condescended to take the time to listen to my live stream? Like, what an honor and a privilege. And then he, inter- he responded to it by acting out in my life to do something good for me. Prayer does change things. You really aren't alone, and he really, really does love you, and he really is working for your good. He really is working for your good. He really, really is working for your good. Now, I I tested this this week, because in that, there was a a situation that could have been very dark. It was very challenging spiritually, and I said, and I was practicing in my head in, in that moment. I said, what if... You know, everything God had given me through that message and and God strengthening me and encouraging me and giving me an experience of his love in a very special, special way, meaningful way. What if, Timothy, just for a moment, you set that aside? You set it aside, act like it's not real. What do you got? Whoa. I ended up at a different, different place. I would end up at a different place altogether. Like I would have gone dark. I would have run. I would have gone into self-protection mode. I would have denial, uh, blame, everything Adam did in the Garden of Eden after he got caught. Um, my soul would have gone to a dark place. But it was absolutely real to me. And so what, what is happening, what, what, what the whole difference was the, the Holy Spirit was communicating to me in a very real way that God is for me, not against me. If God is for me, who can be against me? He's got me. I can let go. All I have to do is this. All, Timothy, you have to do is, you don't have to grasp it. Your soul's needs being met. They're already met. Just realize and understand that, appropriate that, is submit and obey and please the one. Please the one. And everything will be all right. God will take care of the rest. I'm, any consequence, any, any result, I'll be all right with because my soul's not being threatened. That's the difference. So I'm always making, seeking to make a connection between what my soul senses that it needs and must have and how those needs are ultimately being satisfied in Jesus. That's a spiritual discipline you have to learn. You have to experience. Like if there's, I'll say this, if there's just one prayer you want to pray for yourself and someone else, like no matter what the situation, go to Ephesians chapter 3, 16 and 17, 18 and 19. 16 through 19. Just go there and pray that for the person. Pray it for yourself. Like pray it. Get on your knees like Paul did and pray it. 
Like, God, I need this from you. It's got to go past just religion. Pray it for yourself. Pray it for others. It will always be relevant. I don't know that I can give better advice than that. Now, oh, here's what I want you to know. Quick, quick point. Just bear with me. This doesn't mean that Jesus will co-sign on your sin and rebellion. That, this doesn't mean that God loves you so much, he accepts you so much, he's going to co-sign, enable, approve of your sin and rebellion. That is to say, if you go out in rebellion against God, and it's a strong word, and say, I'm going to seek to satisfy my soul some other way, God's going to let you go. You know what I mean? Not, that, not in an ultimate sense, but he's like, okay, go learn the lesson the hard way. Come learn that that's an idol that can't satisfy. Do you want to do this? And I say to myself, I say it to you. Do you want to do things the hard way or the, the, the easy way? Do you want to do things the slow way or the fast way? Like, Timothy, how, long do you, how many times do you have to learn this lesson? Why is this just being deeply implanted in my life at this age of my life? Like, I've, I've come up, and I want to stop and say this too. What I, if you come to understand what I'm saying, maybe you don't, maybe it's still a mystery to you. I, I had a friend of mine who was playing a lot of worship music in my vicinity recently. And you know what I got, took away from that, which I don't often do? It was like, and I thought, you know what, how easy it would be to misunderstand and think that the worship experience, all this music, which is good music, is the experience instead of a reflection of the experience. I think people could get those confused thinking, okay, when I come into a, uh, a worship environment and, I, and I, I just feel so blessed and I feel all these emotions and, I, and we're singing about God's love and to think that that is the experience instead of a reflection of the experience that the Bible is talking about. Now those two things go hand in hand. It's a very subtle distinction that I'm bringing. And I ask myself further, why do... Some worship songs, I say some, worship songs sound like secular love songs. And why do some secular love songs sound like worship songs? Because they're speaking to the soul needs. They've both picked up on that. The soul needs are not just exclusive to Christians. But the, 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 the idea of we can have an amazing worship experience and then give someone the finger in the church parking lot on the way out because they cut us off. You know what I mean? What is that indicative of? Oh, I had this amazing hands-up worship experience, but then, you know, I, I cursed someone out, another, you know, churchgoer in the parking lot because they cut me off. Um, you haven't learned that which you were singing about. We just sang about it again. My peace, my soul will know peace in the storm, essentially what we're singing. But if you haven't learned that lesson, then you think it's a feeling and an emotion in your response to worship instead of in response to God's love for you. And it's just words. But you haven't learned the discipline of appropriating it. Like, okay, that person cut me off from the parking lot, but I don't need them to have my way. I don't need to be in control. God's in control. And I'm good. Instead of giving them one finger, I can give them two fingers. Peace. Because I have peace. You know? Got to keep moving, sake of time. So I say God won't co-sign. You, your, your job, your part of your spiritual discipline is there is healthy shame. And, and God's not going to take away healthy shame. It says Adam and Eve felt shame in the garden. I think part of that was healthy shame. And, and God gives us healthy shame to realize, hey, do it different next time. But healthy shame says, I did bad. I'm, it doesn't say, I am bad. It says, hey, learn and grow. Learn and grow from it. Do it differently next time. Opportunity to grow. You're supposed to listen to your healthy shame. Well, first, you have to distinguish between the two, like healthy and toxic shame. Like healthy shame and toxic shame. Even, um, even before that, you have to consider the possibility of your own self-deception. That's a whole other message. So Micah 7, 9, uh, a verse that Cliff really got me on a while ago. Micah 7, 9 says this. Check us out. There's a harsh word that's going to be used. Punish. I will, I will be patient I will be patient as the Lord punishes me. Sometimes Timothy needs to be punished. That's what I've learned. I need to learn a lesson. I need some discipline. 
For I have sinned against him, but after that, he will take up my case and give me justice for all I have suffered from my enemies. The Lord will bring me into the light, and I will see his righteousness. Like, Lord, you know what? I deserve some consequences right now. I don't have to freak out. I don't have to run. I don't have to fail to take responsibility. I can admit it. I can be open about it. I can be transparent. I can be authentic because you're my set of soul satisfaction, not my pattern of behavior, not my failures, not my mistakes, not my successes. Now, I would challenge you, in light of all we said, to go home this afternoon and read Psalm 103. Read Psalm 103. Read Psalm 103. And see if it doesn't get more traction with you all that we've been, after all we've said. Now, this is only, man. Okay, I gotta stop, right? Technically, I gotta stop. I really, I feel like we're halfway in. Because <laughs> now I wanna take everything we've said and go back to a bunch of different scripture. And I'll just give you a highlight from next week. That's great, because the message is already read, uh, written for next week. I want to get some practical application for all this and for your real life. But how about this verse? In light of everything we've just said. And this, I won't say anything else. We'll just end it here. Again, this is halfway point. So we're not going to have the altar call. <laughs> Till next week. Matthew 16, 26 says, and what, and Jesus says this, and what do, you, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Now, I'm not saying it means something different than what you normally thought that meant, but I'm saying it may mean more than you understood it to mean. What does a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Plenty. He'll trade his soul and the satisfaction of his soul for the chasing of idols, money, career, whatever it might be. What does it profit a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Now that should cause us to think about Jesus. That's Matthew. So we should think back to Matthew chapter 4, the temptation, because Satan was offering to Jesus, hey, you can gain the whole world, all the kingdoms of the world, I'll give to you. So we, we can't forget the context, but Nevertheless, in light of what we've been saying, you see how that, that verse has meaning. We'll pick on that up that next week. I want you to have and experience and learn the skill of appropriating the peace that we sang about in the song Prince of Peace. Will you be back next week? Because I wanted to get you out of here and be all practical and just really get this principle, but we gotta, we got to do it justice. So please be back next week. And I'm going to, there's a lot of scripture here that just is picking up right on the same theme. And I want us to see the continuity. And then I want to pr apply it practically to real life. Oh, okay. It's going to do it. Father, thank you for who you are. Well, thank you that you're not the God that I would have come up with in my imagination. You know, the kind that's performance-based and the kind that withholds affection because it's because of retribution and animosity and contempt and disgust and all the ways that I things I would do if I were God. Lord, I'm so grateful that you are who you are, that I can rest in and who you are as God, that I don't have to be God of my own world to regain control, but I can trust you with control because you know so much far, far better than I do. And I can rest in that. I don't have to have everything figured out. If I got this figured out, Lord, I'll be all right. But Lord, here's my prayer. I, I think my main prayer this morning for your people, for myself, is Lord, please don't let this remain an, a head knowledge, just an intellectual thing, a bullet point on a piece of paper or a word document. Lord, let it be an experience. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower our souls, our inner man, our heart, that we would be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. That we would, our souls would be deeply satisfied so that we could get on with the mission of being the most loving person in the room. in any context. 
Lord, help me to be even more clear next week. Uh, Father, I also want to pray for those who are experiencing illness, uh, who are experiencing struggles even in this moment. Lord, I want to call on you to fulfill your promise. You cause all things to work together for good. To them who are the called according to your purpose, that they would be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. Lord, do this work in us. Lord, help your people to do the work of applying this, walking through their shame, and of learning to appropriate your love for them, even in those situations. Lord, do healing, do soul cleansing through your truth, through your word, through your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed to fellowship. Oh, yeah, and GNL is having a costume party tonight, if you want to be involved, 6 o'clock. Uh, yeah. And then there is a sign-up sheet on our Facebook at this moment for the Friendsgiving, November 21st, 6 p.m., right here. GL meets GNO. And we will say, be saying more about community groups in the near future. Thank you. <laughs>